Welcome to Boss Babies and Bottles, also known as B3, hosted by me, Jessica with a Y, where we talk about how to successfully run a business and capitalize on your strengths while joining motherhood, in my case, twin motherhood, and throwing some crazy shebangs along the way. So pop that bubbly or grab that glass of wine and get ready to unwind. Hey babes, welcome to today's episode of Boss Babies and Bottles. Today we're talking about trusting your gut, aka as I like to call it, swim or swim, (laughs) but just really kind of going with our intuition. Um, And so when I moved back from uh, Puerto Rico as I was coming home, I didn't really know what I was going to do, but I did know I wanted to do something that was more for me, as I had mentioned, something I loved doing, something that I could make into a business, that I could be that it could be flexible for me, but I could also make the income I wanted to make for the future. And so I kind of wanted to dive in and just see different things that I could do. And luckily, I didn't really have to go too far. Um, my sister's mom, who knows me pretty well, she was like, maybe you should do events and weddings. And I had, again, had done, you know, a few events now that you know my background and stuff like I never had I done a wedding though. Um, so I literally picked up the phone one day and started to call randomly all these wedding planners that were listed online. And I don't even remember what website I went to. I want to say I went to the nods. I would like to say that's what I did. But I'm not even 100% sure I did that. I don't know if it was Wedding Wire, if it was just Google. But basically, I cold called all these wedding planners. And again, that was a skill I had learned through working with the knives. And again, not super cold calling, but this was cold calling. I called them all and I was like, hey, uh, my name is Jessica. I'm just looking to get some experience and help out. You don't have to pay me. I just wanted to know what it was like to kind of just do a wedding. And so a lot of wedding planners either did not answer, did not call me back, (laughs) told me to email them my resume. Um, But there were a few, there were three actually, who told me I could do it. So I must have called probably, I would say easily 40 to 50 wedding planners to have gotten a response from three. I remember it being a lot. And I was like, I don't know if this is going to work, but if they tell me yes, then maybe I can go out there and at least learn what it's like. Because I didn't know anyone or had any connection into the industry. But I interned with three different planners and it was an experience, to say the least. One of the ones that I interned with, she did mega weddings, like beautiful, gorgeous, high-end, beautiful weddings. She actually was the only one that paid me, too, the first time I went out. She thought I had experience. Uh, I don't know where she got that from because I definitely did not. It was not on my resume. But she thought I did a good job. She paid me. But that wasn't the experience I'd wanted. The front end was all so beautiful. It made me fall in love with the wedding industry. But the back end, just hearing the way she spoke to everyone, the way that her... Um, other assistants had spoken to each other, just like the way that they all interacted. I did not like that. Another one I interned for, she was like a one man show. Um, and she was so scatterbrained. I didn't know what was going to happen there, (laughs) but I remember helping her to the best of my ability and we pulled it through as usual. Uh, or as, as I like to say, as usual, I always pull everything through, but she was very scatterbrained. Um, but she really enjoyed working with me and she, and she seemed to, and she actually had me come back and help her a few more times after that. And then a third one, I only, um, helped her once. She was, she couldn't even look at me for whatever reason in the eyes and talk to me. It was very uncomfortable, but her other two assistants really seemed to have liked working with her and she was very open and kind to them, but she wasn't with me. I don't know why. I'm not sure what I even did. Um, She only had me there for a portion of the day. She had told me when I was going to leave home and all of that as well. So I did that. (laughs) And again, like I said, I start, I, I did a few more times with that second wedding planner until she didn't pay me. 
And and we had gotten to a point where obviously she was paying me. Like I said at first, I didn't really want them to pay me. I just kind of wanted to go out. But then I, as she wanted me to keep coming back, obviously she started to pay me. And I was like, oh, this is great. Like, And she was so excited to have me there. And she kept talking about how we were going to do things together. And I was super excited to work with her. And, you know, she had somewhat of a brand name. And I should have known it wasn't exactly the direction I wanted to go in. But because I had to pay bills and do things, you know, I needed to make something work. But there's this one time where she told me she was going to pay me X amount because it was a really big wedding. And I had done a lot for it from the planning process to the execution process. And it didn't happen. She didn't pay me. And I didn't even get upset. I was just like, you know what? I should have known. I can do this better. And so I did. I created a logo, a website, (laughs) uh, and I did not create anything. I shouldn't say that. My friend did. Um, Luckily, I have very good friends. Uh, But my friend helped me create it. I sat there with her. I'm so not tech savvy. I'm actually the least tech savvy person if you know me. I'm terrible. I was actually had to walk through how to even do these podcasts so that I could get these all to you guys. So I'm, I'm really bad at these kind of things. But I sat there, I created my first logo. I'm still in love with that logo as much as some people don't even like it. And by some people, I mean my husband and my sister, they don't like it. But I I still love my old logo. I still look at it as a vintage. And I shall continue to look at it like that. (laughs) And everything has changed at this point, even my website, just the way we do everything. But I look back on it and I was like, you know what though? I made the decisions. I loved everything. And I say I created a logo website, bam, it was easy. It wasn't, but it was kind of easy to start a business. Like it wasn't really even that hard. And if you've ever even applied, you know, for a business or anything like that, it's it's really not that difficult. So I'm like, all right, cool. I'm in business. Now I need clients. (laughs) How do I get clients? And again, I, I really did have to pay all these bills. I was living on my own. And so I worked on the side. Um, with throughout in the industry, I started to get jobs with like caterers and I was somewhat of a like wait staff and I was helping serve and it was never, it was a job I I mentioned to you guys that I had thought I wanted to do before I started working for the knives, like waitressing. Catering is a little bit different because when you're catering an event, it's again, it's very different. Um, but I started doing that and that was, um, just different. It, you know, it's, it's, it wasn't exactly what I wanted to do, but at least I was still in the event industry. And, you know, for the most part, at least anytime I got one of those gigs, they were most part during the week. And so I was able to, you know, make some extra money, which was great. And then on the weekends, I would try to save it for as many weddings as I could. So I worked with other planners. Um, like I said, trying to be like their bridal valet or an assistant. I had made just a few connections in my intern in my interning times. And so I tried to do the best that I could. So I started to promote myself um, online and I was on Google. I was on Thumbtack, which is like almost like a place where you go when you need any type of service and you can kind of request quotes. Um, So I was on there. I did not start doing any major advertising, like paying advertising until later. Like I would pay for the little bit that I had to pay for to kind of just be up and running. And I started to get referrals too, which was great. But Thumbtack was a huge source for me. So I landed my first event um, and it was an Indian baptism. I had no idea what that was. So it was a Christian family um, that was an Indian background. And I'm still friends with them to this day. I have done multiple events for them at this point, um, which is what got me into this industry in the Indian, um, industry to begin with, uh, or, or our clientele, I guess I would better say. And these, at first I was like very unsure what was going to happen. It was an event that was actually close to home, which is great. I met with the husband, not the wife, which was weird at first, but it was their first kid. So she had just had a newborn and they were doing this baptism And I told him yes to everything. (laughs) I was like, he's, I'm having this meeting with him and he's like, and I want this and we want this and I want this. And I, and I was like, yeah, we can do all of that for sure. No problem. Yeah. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah. You want me to make your centerpieces? I can totally make centerpieces from scratch. Lies guys. I had never made a centerpiece in my life. Um, he was like telling me he wanted this balloon arch and like all these different things, like things that I had never done in my right mind. And I'm here having this meeting with him in person. I'm like, yeah, I can totally do this. We're walking through the space. I'm like, yeah, I can convert this. I can do this. No problem. 
And then at the end he goes, oh, and by the way, we only have two hours to set up. And I was like, sure, yeah, of course, no sweat, I can do this. And guys, I swear to you, this is where, like, my swim or swim mentality really had to come into place. There's no such thing for me as sink or swim. That's my secret weapon, trusting my gut and telling myself, you know what, I'm going to do this no matter what, okay? And it's that thought process of, I'm going to figure it out, you know, whatever it is that that takes. And so we had two hours. It was six family members and friends that had to come out and help me for that day. I even recruited my abuela, guys, like my grandmother. She was there. Um, it was crazy. It was um, my mom, my grandma, uh, my I think my sister was there. I'm not sure. My dad was there. Uh, my friends were there. I had like two or three friends there. I mean, like people were just there. And I was like, look, I know that I'm asking for a lot, but if you can come out, just help me set up. I can do the rest. Once it's set up, this was 200 people for a baptism for the first child of this family. And I was like, 200 people? I thought the Hispanic community was crazy, you know, and crazy and big and loves to party. But I would like to say, having done basically every culture at this point, wedding, I would love to say that the Indian culture by far is not only one of my favorites, but it is the craziest. Um, they are just huge at these events. Like they love doing these events. And so it was just so much fun. Um, not fun while I was setting up, <laughs> but when it was all done, that I had completed everything, that the clients were excited, it was fun. Um, I remember I had asked my dad to go pick up. I made balloon centerpieces. I made like this balloon arch. I had to dress all the tables and chairs, which was the hardest part. We had to dress um, and put chair covers on 200 chairs, do the bows on them. Again, dress all of the tables. Do these? I had to do the centerpieces there because they were balloons. So my dad had to go. He picked them up from Party City for me while we began the setup. He brought them to me, and then I had to actually do them. And mind you, this doesn't even include the test centerpieces I had to do before to ensure that I could actually do them the day of. We had to put draping on the ceiling. I remember that. I just remembered that. Oh, my God. Jesus. Um, with magnets and these, like, tool things that we had made. And I had I even went beforehand to make sure that I could do this. And I knew it was going to take forever, and I had to figure it out. Um, but this, again, was my swim or swim mentality, right? That's my secret weapon in life. Um, and it's really all about just trusting how I feel and just figuring it out. And, you know, I talked to you guys about redefining myself in episode four, and that wasn't easy. It was really the hardest thing I've ever had, I ever had to do, you know, in my life. Twins might change that at this point, you know, once we have them, but, you know, really kind of just defining who I wanted to be and what I wanted out of life and working towards that was, was extremely difficult, but it really is the best thing that you can do for yourself. You change everything, you turn your whole life around, and it is so scary, I can't tell you how many times like I probably cried over just changing everything because it's not easy, you know, and I've I've talked through, you know, some of my closest friends and family through this that portion of their life too where they've had to just change everything and it's just I know I see it, I hear it in their voice and I remember feeling it myself just how scary it is to change your whole life around. You know, but when you hear that voice inside your head saying something has to change and you hear it over and over and over again and some things are just not sitting with you well anymore, you need to listen to that voice. The sooner you listen, the sooner you'll find that joy that you're missing, that peace that you're missing, you know, and I've, I've felt that before when you're like, what am I missing? Something's missing in my life and I just don't know what it is. You need to sit and listen to yourself or journal till you'll find it, or think about till you'll find it, or take a weekend of whatever it is for yourself and figure it out, because you need to listen to yourself, because being scared is inevitable. I mean, every you know how many things in life have scared us? I mean, I'm pretty sure you guys can count on a lot of them, you know? You're never ready. Whoever said that you were ready for change is a lie, you know? I told one of my friends a few years back, you know, I remember her going through this big life change, and I and she was like, I'm just I'm just not ready for that. And I looked at her and I was like, You're never really ready. And she looked at me with this face, and I was like, I mean, are you? Do you ever really feel truly ready for anything? You know? And now we laugh and we quote about it. You know, we we quote and we quote that one line about it. 
And she's, and where we look at each other, and we're just like, yeah, you're never really ready. <laughs> you know, you're never really ready for a lot of life's obstacles and a lot of things that come our way, but we handle them, you know, and sometimes we look back and we're like, you know what we handled, I handled that well. And that's how it should be. You know what I mean? But you're never really ready for it. There's a lot of instances I feel like where I trusted my gut and I always, always, I feel like I, I listen to myself a lot and I've learned to hone that skill and it does take, I think, some time. But I always ask myself internally to see how I feel, you know, and I don't always just ask myself just once, you know, I ask myself a few times sometimes how I feel about certain things like, you know, when, and I have a lot of instances about this, but not going away for college. Like I got in to a few colleges out of state, even in state, and I didn't think it was time. Even though I had visited some of these schools and I thought they would be great for me. And again, I was going in as a pre-med major. But not going away to college was a hard decision to make because I got into such great schools. But I knew that it was the right decision for me at that time. You know, and for really for my family at that time as well. You know, I didn't feel like I was ready to be separated or that my mom really and my brother were really were really ready to have me separate from them and even me from them and just what we were doing and where my life was at the moment. And it was the three of us, you know what I mean, living under the same roof. Like I'd mentioned, my parents were divorced and I just, I didn't think we were there yet, you know, and that I was there yet. And then I had another moment where I had to change my major, where I went from pre-med to business. And that was also a very hard decision because my whole life, I thought that I was going and in, going into medicine my whole life. I, I don't think I ever really thought there was too much to anything. I, I went into different paths inside of medicine, but I never really changed, you know, my thought process until my first two years of college, you know, and then I started to get experience in other things. And I realized, you know, I wanted to do business and sales and marketing and all of that stuff instead. Hence my double major in marketing and economics, you know, but that was, took me a while to really, I think, sit with me, like, I'm going to change my life's goal, like, or my life's vision, what I thought was going to be my life's vision, you know, moving out of the house at 2021, that was another big thing that I feel like I had to trust my gut on, and that was, that one was a very difficult one, because I was literally going to change my whole entire life, um, I went from living in the same house as, as I know most people do, right, until, to not, and being fully independent. I was already starting to pay my own bills and do my own thing. I had my own job. I made my own money. You know, all of those things. But I knew it was time for me to leave. When the environment around me felt toxic and felt like I wasn't growing, I knew it was time for me to go, you know. And I was in a home where nothing nothing happened. I just didn't feel like I could be myself 100%. I didn't feel like I belonged, you know. I, I love my mom and my brother, but they're very similar, and it was just not a place that I thought I really fit in, you know, and so I knew that it was time for me to move, and going to Puerto Rico felt like the right thing to do, and I had a bunch of people everywhere telling me this was not the right move, that I should not be going over there, and I remember sitting there crying, I'm sure, because I cry for everything, I'm one of those, and I was like, what am I going to do? Like, am I going to do this? Like, am I going to change my whole entire life? And, and I was like, you know what? I have to go and try. And if, if I don't succeed, and at that moment, I didn't really have that thought process of swim or swim. I don't think in that exact moment, but I was like, if I don't succeed, then I come back home and I figure it out. But if I succeed, my whole life will change, you know? And so knowing that you can make those decisions sometimes, and that's okay. And then when I remember being there, I was like, you know what? Like, I'm here to work. I'm here to move. And we were number one in the region that year. And, and that was, like I said, one of, the, one of the best feelings, knowing that I was able to do something that hadn't been done in a really long time in that area. And so I knew it was time to leave my house. And I knew that if I left my house at the age of 2021, 20, I was almost 21, I was not coming back. You know, I knew that if I left... Like, I had to be able to support myself forever and ever <laughs> because that was it, you know? And then moving over there and then coming back home with no plan. Um, I remember I was saying, you know, I remember, you know, and I told you guys, 
I was over there and I was like, I got to come home. And, and I just did. And I didn't have a plan. I didn't have too much of a plan. I just knew that I was coming home and that I had to figure it out. And I had to listen to myself because that was probably the longest time I never listened to myself. While I was over there, while I was working, I was busy. I would work 7 a.m. to midnight, multiple days in a row, uh, Monday through Sunday. I mean, I had one day off a week that was somewhat Tuesdays um, where I wouldn't work 7 a.m. to midnight. I would work, but not the whole entire day. And, you know, I ignored myself, my feelings, and I got to a point where I was not happy whatsoever. And so coming home, I was feeling so liberated, but I didn't really come home with a plan. But I knew that that was the right thing to do when I finally started to listen to myself. And even, I do it all the time, even with, you know, <laughs> I know it sounds crazy, but if you follow my canal.twins Instagram, you'll see on there, I, you know, I trust in my gut and my feelings about the sexes of my kids. I trusted my gut when it come, came to buying, you know, our new home with me and my husband. You know, we had to come up with a big decision with, whether we were going to go all in and buy this house or if we were going to stay where we were in the comfort of our current life. And that was a really hard decision for us, too. And I remember looking at him. He's like, what do you think? What do you feel? Because he knows that I always ask myself and I, I am such an internally asked person. Like I always ask myself internally how I feel about things. And I remember he looked at me and he asked me, he's like, for real, how do you feel? And I was like, to be honest, I'm so scared. I want to say no, that we should not move and we should stay here in our townhouse and, and just be happy here and we'll be okay. And you know what I mean? I'll figure out how I'm going to do it with twins and stairs and the whole thing. But I knew that that wasn't the right decision. I knew internally that the right decision was to move and we had to go all in and it was uncomfortable and with especially the COVID-19 and being pregnant and the whole thing. It was just, there were so many variables, but I knew it was the right thing to do as scary as it was. And that's exactly what I said to him. I said, I don't want to, <laughs> don't get me wrong. I'm, I'm so scared, but I think this is the right move for us. And now, you know, two, three months later, I don't even know where we are, how long we've been here. But now these, you know, few months later, I'm like, this was the best decision we could have ever done. And it was super scary, again, going all in financially on something. But it was, again, the best decision. And trusting my gut and knowing that we were going to succeed and we were going to figure it out no matter what, you know, has been very crucial to us. And, you know, he doesn't necessarily go with my swim or swim method, but he does believe in the same thing. And, you know, when you give yourself no other option but to succeed, then you will do it. Sometimes... We have crutches in life that we give ourselves. We say it's okay. You know, like we go and we start our passion project, our side hustle, and we don't give it 100% because we have something else that we're doing full time, you know, because we're doing just, just on the side. And so you, that's basically giving yourself sometimes a crutch. Sometimes you just have to say, you know what, I'm going all in, you know. And maybe you don't go all in because you can't, because you have something right now and, and you just, you can't, you can't give up. You're, this is going to be a side project, a side hustle for you, a passion project, whatever you want to call it. And you can't necessarily give up what you're doing full time because, you know, you do have, you're, you know, you're not, you're not in your 20s, you're not living at home. You need to um, make money and that's fine, but give it 100%. Don't give yourself a crutch, okay? Yes, it's hard to work 24-7. Yes, it's hard to not... To, be, to, not, to come home and not be able to relax or do other things or work on the weekend. You know, like sometimes we want to relax and do all those things. But, you know, I'll tell you, you know, from owning your own business, like sometimes you just, you have to work harder. And if you have a side project, it means it's going to take up your evenings and your weekends. And that's okay. Life is what we make of it, you know. Some people are like, oh, life is what it is. And I'm like, no, life is what we make of it. You know what I mean? That's such a huge thing. I'm like, life is what we make of it. And, and I quote you know, myself in this, because I love this line. I, I, I put, I believe in destiny and God, but I also do believe that we're fated to choose. And it's a line from my vows. I'm talking to my husband at that point, but I do think that that's all of life. You know, I do believe that there's the destiny. I do believe that there's a God, but I think that we're fated also to choose what we want our life to be. Our life is what we make of it. Okay. And I firmly believe this. So Bames, it's time to swim or swim. It's time to go out there and make your dreams a reality, whatever that might be, whether it's a business, whether it's a side project, you know, a side hustle, a passion project, a goal, um, your life, what you want your life to look like in a certain amount of years. 
It's time to do it. It's time to manifest it. It's time to redefine yourself. It's time to trust yourself and make it happen. Because at the end of the day, no one's going to do it for you. No one. Only yourself. And so get out there and let's make it happen, babes. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. I cannot wait to chat with you guys soon. So make sure if you haven't already, subscribe to our next episode and follow my craziness on Instagram at ebjevents and at canal.twins. I promise you, something's always happening.